Chanda, I don't know what's wrong with this thing. Oh, so you have issues too. Every time I literally click on the screen and I do anything to the screen, the video leaves. Like the whole page goes away. I don't even know what happens. It disappears. Yeah, I was, I was in the meeting, then they kicked me out. And when I try to log back in, it says the host has another meeting in progress. This is a recurring meeting. Uh, but I don't even know how to get back to the other page. Like literally, I'll see myself on the video. Okay. If I touch anything, literally, if I try to scroll down to get a better picture, anything, it disappears. What? Yes. This is crazy. No, I don't want to leave the meeting. It's not even it's telling me to test the computer audio. Like, and I'm probably live you, cutting up. Like, I don't know what's wrong when I'm live, probably. Yes. I don't know. It says live on Facebook. But I can't do anything to this screen. Yeah, it's in your live. Yeah. Yes, looking at you. It's okay. People watching. I, but I can't do I can't do anything to this screen. Can you join can you join the meeting? Maybe I have to invite you. I gotta see because I can't even see the bottom of the screen. Invite. Yeah, you are live. I'm looking at it now. Okay. And I can't. I can't. Let me let me try to send it to you. you yeah. Oh, but do it email. That's what I'm trying to do. But I just, oh snap. I can't even fix this right now. You can hear me. I can hear myself on the live, but I can't get into the meeting. Can you see my screen or can you? Yeah, I can see you. You can see me, but you can't see the screen. see you on the live, but mm -hmm. I can't see you on my computer to get to the meeting. Okay. I mean, I understand that. I'm I'm talking about what you can see on the screen, though. Because I'm trying to get into Google to send you the meeting, and I can't do that. <laughs> okay. I just didn't want everybody's email addresses to be out there. John, I don't understand what your laptop is doing, dear. Like I touch any button and it's not doing, I don't understand what this is, what is happening right now. You have to, um, like wherever you go, and then do something. I have to do what now? Click the, um, so like if you scroll, you have to, after you put the scroll, you have to click the mouse again to stay there. Wherever I scroll to, I have to click the mouse again to stay wherever I want it to stay. Yes. Wherever you scroll to, click the mouse. I can't get back here that long. We might, be doing we might have to get off and do a whole new invite because I can't get on. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to send you the invite to the one that I'm already on right now. But when I move it, it moves. <laughs> I don't the mean to move it. Is, the funny thing is you can hear me on the live. Like I can hear me talking to you on the live. Right, because you're on the phone and I'm using the computer audio. So you're, you can hear yourself on live because my phone is right here. That's how, that's how you can hear yourself. I got you. Okay. Now it says waiting for a host. I don't know what just happened. Oh my gosh. Uh, uh, Lord. Okay, Lord. <laughs> so you can't even you can't even get out of the lodge.
I, I can't, I, I'm scared to touch anything, but try to get you and Bishop D's invites. At least he got three minutes. Well, I told him to just be watching and we'll let him know when it's time to come on. So, I don't know how I got kicked out. I was doing good. I was. Like, I'm scared to use your mouse. <laughs> You didn't have those issues before. I know I didn't. And it's not been used since we since I shut down last week. I mean, yeah, last time. Okay, that was sent. So now hopefully that was sent to your email. Where'd it go? Now where'd the meeting go? Jonathan, oh. now the meeting's gone. And if the meeting's gone, I don't know where it went. Like it literally went away and I don't know where it went. At the bottom of the screen. You see the, the icon at the bottom of the screen? What, which icon? The Zoom camera. Oh, uh, well, thank you, ma'am. That way I ain't got to start a new one, but I still can't touch anything. <laughs> I don't understand. Well, it's all oh, good. You said you sent me through it to it. To, you sent something through my email? Yes, I sent you the new meeting invite through email. Huh. That's not popping up. Oh. It's the same meeting invite? It's the one I, I don't think it's the, I don't know. All right, let me try. I don't know, sis. I don't know. Oh, Lord Jesus. Father, you know what we were trying to do. Bishop must have something real good to tell us tonight. <laughs> mm. I ain't even gonna blame Satan on, I ain't even gonna get this to Satan. I just don't know how to work the technology. <laughs> mm. That's right, Bill. Nope, that's not right. They won't let me get back on at all. Jesus. They won't let you get back into Zoom at all? Okay. It just keeps saying launching. And it's just that's so what, yeah, that was it. That's what it was doing to me. Same thing. The host has another meeting in progress. This is a recurring meeting. This is a host. Please log in and start this meeting. I'm not the host. I just sent the invite. Invite. I guess I have to send you guys. I'm in the, the one that you can see. And that's where I send the invite from this one. Yeah, it's not showing up in my email. All right. Uh, I don't know if this keeps. Uh, You're still alive, too. Yep. Sorry, guys. Y'all see the good, the bad, the ugly. <laughs> we gonna praise him after this, right? Right. Only because we gonna learn this stuff. Mm. 
right? I have to keep opening my email to send you the invite. So here's another one. Okay, how about let me just, I'm gonna take a picture of it. Cause all you need is a meeting ID and the password, right? How about I don't send you the invite and I send you the invite information? Well, I mean, it's the same, I got that. It's the same meeting ID and information from before. Well, I don't know. See if this is the same or not. I'm I'm right from the the live that you can see me on right now. I don't understand. See if it's the same or different. I'm gonna send it to you through text. Is that the same information? Don't you get it? Where's the eight? No, this is a totally different meeting ID number. That okay. Much well, I guess every time it goes out, so that's why I'm uh, so that's why I'm scared to touch it. All right, hold up. Well, I hope Bishop can get in from what you sent him. It's the same one <laughs> you sent me. You might have sent him something different. Yeah. All right, eight, nine, Okay, there's Bishop someone. Okay, how did Bishop get in? Hi. Hey, Bishop, you got in. <laughs> After a little bit of difficulty, how you doing? Oh, see, I don't know if you've seen it at all on our live, but we have had this big culty. <laughs> We just John is trying to get in there. I, I got a little bit of I got some uh, news that's not good. Oh, we don't say it now because we on live already. Unless you want no, to. I, well, the church needs you. Y'all need to know this, but. but we'll right, talk. Let's, we'll let's, talk let's, after let's, we disconnect the live. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, okay. Hi. Hi. Hey. Hi, Facebook family. <laughs> Y'all, I hope y'all be praying. <laughs> That's all I got to say about that. Woo! Oh, oh my goodness. goodness. Mm. Well. How has your day been? Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. Oh my good. goodness. Interesting, good, interesting, bad, or just interesting? You don't want to elaborate. Oh. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. And so it is 7.06. We are, um, have been going for a few minutes before seven, but literally finally got everybody together. <laughs> yes, we're all yeah. together now. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We want to say hey to everybody who is joining us on Facebook Live. Thank Was you. Was it just the three of us? Yes, because you are our special yes. guest, Bishop. Oh, so, okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Those of you who have already joined, welcome to, and that's, that's the kind of guy we serve. serve. <laughs> We're a little off with our, <laughs> you're not in too much unison on it tonight. <laughs> so we know that we have something awesome on tonight. That's why all these things are happening, all these technology difficulties. And then we're technologically inclined. No, not what's the word? 
um, um impaired. Tech savvy. impaired impaired yes impaired that's the word impaired is the word from <laughs> okay. so technologically handicapped okay yes <laughs> So I'm your host, Jonda, and our co-host, well, we're, we're host together, is... Lydia. Hey, y'all. Lydia. And tonight we have our very own Bishop G. Tony White with us. Ooh. Amen. Praise he the is the presiding prelate of Eastern Shore Community Ministries and the pastor of Living Word Community Church in Parksley, Virginia. So we're excited to have him on. And as we know, we don't even have our music playing on tonight, but we know this is a testimony platform. We know what, you know, what we're here to do tonight. We're just here to share the good news of Jesus Christ and share our testimonies on tonight with everyone. Um, so I will, um, I, do I open with prayer and do you do scripture or vice versa or how are we going to do that? Okay, I'll open with prayer and then Lydia is going to uh, read our theme scripture and then we'll proceed. Amen. Amen. Our Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, Father, we come before you once again. First and foremost, God, we just want to thank you and praise you, thank Lord, you. just for this opportunity, oh God, that you have given us to come before um, your people on tonight, God. We just come, oh God, just to give our testimonies, oh God, and just tell of your goodness, oh God, in the midst of everything that's going on in this world, God. Yes, you're still Lord. blessing us, God. You're still an amazing God. You're still a wonderful and awesome God. And we ask you, God, to bless those that are joining on tonight. We pray, Lord God, that they will be encouraged and uplifted, oh God, and something is said, oh God, if they don't know you, oh God, that they will take the opportunity to seek who you are, oh God, and get to know who you are and let you be Lord and Savior of their life. So Father, we just ask you to have your way. Bless Bishop White on tonight as he joins us. Thank you for him um, taking the time out, oh God, to share the good news with everyone, oh God. And we just ask you to have your way, oh God. We give you glory, honor, and praise, and we truly thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 And our theme scripture is Psalm 105 and 1. Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. So that is what our, we are endeavoring to do, is to let the whole world know how great our God is in the midst of all this craziness. And there's always crazy. There's always, mm -hmm. from the beginning of time, been crazy in the world, right? But God has yes. always been good, all right? <laughs> so we want to yes, yes, uh, yes. accentuate the goodness of the Lord. Amen. 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 John, do you got a, a, a testimony from the last time to this time, honey? I do. You do. You do. Share. I always got a testimony to tell. Do share, you know, honey. I always got something to share. Yes, talk about it. <laughs> so, um, if everyone remembers, and, and as you come in, guys, say hi, share the video, like it, and share it with others who you think could um, would be encouraged by what is said on tonight, and. If you um, are interested, before I get into my testimony, I'm sorry. If you're interested in giving your testimony, please inbox us or yes, send us a text message. If you know our numbers or inbox us on Facebook, and we'll be glad to have you on. But I will start off with a quick testimony. Um, as you all may have remembered, and some don't, I gave the testimony last time about my sister who had a massive stroke. Um, and the doctors basically thought that she wasn't going to make it. They said that um she wasn't if she did make it she wouldn't be able to comprehend and she wouldn't be able to talk and she wouldn't be able to be the right side and wouldn't be able to walk but as i said well she has defied every odd that she could defy and she has defied everything that man said because when god says yes when man says no god says yes mm -hmm. and um that's an update she is doing wonderful she has progressed tremendously she is on a rehab and I talked to her earlier. Um, her memory has been affected, yes, but we know that that's going to get better. And she sounded really good when I talked to her earlier. They had her up walking today um, ooh, ooh. on the parallel um, parallel bar. She was walking, yes. She's pivoting, so she's able to turn. And um, yes, yes, yes. She is doing so wonderful, and it's just getting better and better. And I talked to her, and then she said, you know what? I can't remember a whole lot, she said, but I know I will. And I said, yes, sister, you will. You will Amen. remember everything again. Mm -hmm. And she is just doing wonderful. So I just encourage y'all to please just keep praying 
and keep lifting her. Her name is Vicki Davis. If you don't know her, keep her name lifted before the Lord because God is doing amazing things in her life. And I believe that he's going to bring her back 100%. And she's going to walk and tell her testimony and tell her the goodness of God and tell her what he did for her. Yeah. Um, I told her, I said, you came a long way. And she said, well, I didn't know that, but I'm glad you told me. I said, yes, sister, you came a long way. But I'm just grateful. She remembers who I am every time I call her. So I'm I'm grateful today. Oh <laughs> I know Amen. that. I know. Wonderful. Yes, I know that eventually she's gonna get all her memory back. But the doctors and nurses saying that she's doing wonderful. They said they love her. That's her. they her. She's their favorite patient in the rehab already. She's only been there two days. So we know Vicky. She's a people person anyway. So she makes friends wherever she goes. So yes, yeah, so that's my testimony for this this episode of. And that's the kind of God we serve because He is a great God. And I just want to keep telling about his goodness. Amen. Oh, yes. Well, let me share a little bit of mine. I can only give bits and pieces because it's my testimony, but it's not my testimony, but I'm going to share it anyway. Okay. Okay. So I have one child <laughs> and every parent who has any amount of children, um, we all are super concerned when it comes to, you know, I didn't understand people when they said, oh, wait till they get grown because then they're, you know, they're, they're, they're on your heart more mm -hmm. when they're not in your house. And so my daughter is serving in the Navy and this whole process has been a true test of faith for me and letting, and letting go and letting God take care of my child <laughs> who I like to hold on so tight to. So she was on, I don't know if you guys have seen in the, the news about the USS Roosevelt and um, the captain and just a whole bunch of stuff that's been happening as far as coronavirus, um, mm -hmm. um, the people who had coronavirus that were on this ship. Well, you guys, that is the ship my daughter is, is assigned to. So due to some unforeseen circumstances, earlier in this year that took her off of the ship and put her temporarily in another unit now the circumstances looked very bad we were sad it, it was heartbreaking it, you know something that you don't want your child to have to experience <laughs> but when i look at it now my child could have been on that ship with all wow. of those people who had coronavirus now you, <laughs> this is how one of those things I, you know, I remember a message Pastor Mike Todd said, you're going to look back one day and say, oh, that was God. That, yeah, was, God. that was God. And, and while we were sad at the moment and we just, you know, okay, God, whatever happens, happens. We trust you for our lives. You know, we, you know, we know that you have a great plan. It's not the end of the world, though it's sad. When I look at now <laughs> and mm -hmm. what could have been, I'm so grateful that what needed to happen at that time to spare her from being on the ship happened because my kid would have been on that ship stuck wow. in the ocean mm -hmm. with all those people with coronavirus. So I am grateful to God. And, and that's the kind of God we serve. God and I am grateful Lord. to him. And, it's, and it really goes even deeper than that because she was on another ship that was stranded in the ocean because of the coronavirus. God brought her off of that one to this one and then mm. took her off of this one so she wasn't on that one. Wow. <laughs> Y'all, I'm just messed up. I'm just messed up. So that's my that's Ooh. my testimony for the week. And that's the kind of guy we serve. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Amen. He's a good guy. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Amen. I'm going to give him glory. God is good. So y'all, you I'm ladies, gentlemen, uh, uh, elders, preachers, boys, girls, saints, and friends. Grab, grab your spouses, grab your husbands, grab your sons, um, grab your cousins. Um, this is our our first male guest that we have on our show. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're evolving. We're evolving. <laughs> But I want you guys now, now, John and I have heard bits and pieces. I know we haven't heard it all, but we've heard a lot of it being, you know, parishioners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we know how powerful whites to. So I want you guys to really just listen, take it all in. It's yeah, just powerful. Y'all thought last week was powerful. This week is powerful. <laughs> And I really yes. want you all to really just sit with your tent door and open 
you know, and really and really enjoy um, the testimony that Bishop White is going to give. So Jonda already gave us a brief little introduction yeah. already. So Bishop, we're going to turn it over to you. And we want to ask the very first question that we ask all of our guests. And then we'll evolve mm -hmm. from there as you decide to and choose to add color to the story. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the defining moment in your life that brought you to Christ? Well, I'd have to say it was a combination of things. Um, I, look, I look back on it now, and uh, I didn't realize it was the Lord, but um, there was, I was trying to make some changes that uh, I wasn't having very, very much success on my own. Uh, before I got saved, I was, uh, I lived a, a, a life, the life of a lot of sinners. I was a I, I abused alcohol, I abused drugs. I was a very heavy smoker. And um, my big thing was that I was, I found myself really wanting to stop smoking. I thought that I was in charge of everything in my life. But the thing that was really bothering the most, uh, bothering me the most was that uh, my smoking increased until I was smoking almost three packs of cigarettes a day. Ooh, and uh, wow. I really wanted to quit. So uh, I just gotten married. My wife and I just gotten married. And uh, uh, in hindsight, now I see where a lot of uh, she brought a lot of things into uh, my memory that brought a lot of things to my memory that I realized were still working there that I wasn't aware of until much later. And a lot of these things she probably had discussed some with my late mother-in-law, but my mother-in-law had just kept uh, praying for me. She, she really loved me and she just kept praying for me and she had no idea. I don't think she had much idea about what exactly I was involved in, but she just kept telling me how good the Lord was and uh, the positive impact that he could have on my life. And I didn't know anything about the Lord. I, I mean, I, I knew enough about church and church people to know that there was a difference, a marked difference between those who were just church goers and those who were deeply committed. And um, because there was a lady in our neighborhood who used to hold meetings at a little, uh, uh, little place around the corner from us called Sister Mary Shannon. And there was something about her that impressed everybody, even some of the most uh, Hard, the hardest of centers in our neighborhood. And they were always talking about her with a lot of respect. And some of the pastors uh, of some of the churches in, in our general neighborhood, they kind of spoke about them any kind of way. And some of the members who went there and some of the members I knew and mm -hmm. I saw, I, so I, what I saw in their lives didn't match up to what they say they believe. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know enough mm -hmm. to know that there, that there was a real difference until I started seeing people talk and hearing people talk about Sister Mary Shannon. And my mother always used to tell me, she said, she said, listen, when she's down there playing, when they're down there singing, and you could hear them all, you could hear them a block away. And uh, they, were, they were singing, all they had was a washboard and a tub and uh, tambourines. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they started singing, you could hear them all over the neighborhood. And uh, everybody got quiet. And uh, my mother would say, you know, now one thing you, you need to do, you need to respect that lady. So that's a that's a holy and sanctified woman. But she <laughs> never she never gave that much respect uh, to the others. I mean, she gave them grudging respect, but not to the same level that she did her. There, so I realized then there was something different about her. Mm. There was something about her that people were afraid to uh, badmouth her or to or to say anything negative about her. And uh, so that was probably my first influence. And then, and then my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law was saved. And my wife used to try to tell me what it meant to be saved. And I didn't understand the word saved or what it meant, but I knew that I, I needed some help. I had been to rehab and that didn't work. Uh, the, one of the directors at the rehab kept telling me every time I would go back to get tested and I'd come up negative and she, uh, uh, 
she would tell me, she said, I don't know why you keep coming. She said, because you don't have any desire to get off. She said, I think you're gonna wind up dying on these drugs. Oh, That's exactly what she said to me. So I didn't tell my wife what happened, but um, I remember that I just wanted to quit smoking. That was all I wanted. I wanted to stop smoking. I kept trying, kept trying. The more I tried to stop, the more I smoked. And uh, yeah. the morning that my wife invited me to go to church with her, I says, after she got saved, uh, I told her I wasn't going to go. I just didn't want to go. So a friend of mine came by. He was actually, I had been our, my best man when we got married, asked me to go somewhere with him. And uh, I told him, well, I don't know. Well, do you need anything? I, I knew what that meant. Did I need some drugs? I said, well, yeah, come on by. He came by. And uh, he asked me, said, well, you want to go take a ride with me? I, I, I had to think about it. And I said, no, I don't think so. Now, this was not me. Mm -hmm. to say that um, I don't think I'm going to go. I, it just wouldn't be right for me to tell my wife I wouldn't go to church with her and then to turn around and go somewhere where you, they wouldn't seem right. And he said, well, do you need anything? I said, I, I, don't, I don't have any cigarettes. Can you give me a cigarette? I, he gave me a cigarette. I lit it. And I took about three puffs off that cigarette. And I mean, I'd been smoking for about 15 years. And for the first time, I mean, that cigarette made me actually sick. I leaned over the mm. fence mm. and I mean, I just, uh -huh. everything went. I mean, I was, I mean, I actually got sick and I took the cigarette and put it out and I told mm. him, I said, man, something must be up. I said, I've never, cigarettes never made me sick. And mm. uh, I told him, I said, I think mm. I'm going to go to church with her. Mm. And it was the end of that. End of that. And he left. Wow. And uh, long story short, that was the day I got saved because I, I realized then that if, if something didn't happen and my life didn't change, I didn't know anything about praying. I didn't know what was a good prayer, a bad prayer, positive prayer. I didn't know anything about that. All I could say to my say to the Lord, I guess it was Him. Uh, if you if you're real and you say you're real, mm -hmm. if you don't help me, I might as well check out. Wow. And that's exactly what I felt. I mean, I was at the point where I wanted to change, and mm -hmm. I wanted to stop. I want everything that was going on in my life to stop. I wanted to stop it. And I tried everything I could and nothing was working. And I said, and if you can't help me, I might as well check out. And that's exactly what I meant. Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't wow. brave enough to really do anything to myself. But I remembered um, um, that one guy, a, a friend, a late friend of mine had told me that if, you, if you're too afraid to walk and step in front of a truck, or take some poison or something like that. Just uh, get so high, get so stoned until you until do as much as you can until it until you just don't care what happens to you. Your Either you friend, die from it. Your friend told you this. Yeah. That's not okay. He I'm, said either, he said you'll be so <laughs> numb you won't see it coming. That's not a friend. Wow. Okay. He said you he said you won't see it coming, and I thought that was going to be my out. I said yeah, I might as well just check out, and I thought that's probably what I was going to wind up doing. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So that's just proof positive that it does not matter what your plan is. If God's got a plan for your life, I don't care what you do. It's yes. not going to work. That's true. That's true. But here again, like I said, the, uh, the, the, the strong, most powerful influence behind all of that was uh, my mother-in-law. She just kept telling me how good the Lord was. And you know how it is when you're not saved. People are always telling you, you need to stop doing this. You need to stop doing that. And you get used to hearing that. In other words, as if you could change your whole life yourself. But she never said that. She never, she never uh, said anything negative to me. She never demeaned me or put me down. She just kept telling me how good the Lord was, how much he loved me, and what he could do with my life. And I wasn't used to hearing that. And mm. uh, I remember her talking to me one time, and it just I broke down and started crying. I just I couldn't figure that out. I could want, why am I crying? Mm. Wow, that's the word with love and kindness. It's not exactly. The, it's not the mm -hmm. the grenade Bible that you go beating people over the head with. It's not you know people already know what they're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. and, you know, what they need to know is how they can change and do it, do things different. And so, I was I didn't understand how a God that with my concept of God, how could a God love me and love what I was doing? But she just kept telling me, uh, He loves you. He really loves you. 
-hmm. And that day in church, before I realized what was going on, I remember it's almost like a newsreel of my life was being played. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there in the pew, and uh, it's like a newsreel of my life was being played back in my memory. And he kept, well, you remember when you were doing this and when you were doing mm -hmm. that, and when you were in this place, you had mm -hmm. no business being, and this mm -hmm. didn't happen to you or that didn't happen to you. I saw what you did, but I loved you anyway. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that was really what started breaking my heart that day in church. And uh, before I knew it, I started crying again. And uh, the more I cried, the better I felt. Mm -hmm. I just felt like a giant weight was lifted up off my shoulders. Oof, my it God. was powerful. It was a very powerful experience. Mm, 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 mm. Mm, awesome. And see, I think for so some people, it doesn't happen like that. Like it's a, like a, um, a gradual, but to hear that it does happen at one specific time where you're sitting right there and you can remember the exact day and time that you got saved and the Lord called you and you answered. That is just like the most wonderful experience. And I think a lot of people need to understand also that God loves us no matter what we're doing, mm -hmm. no matter who we are. And just because he loves us does not mean that he accepts our sinful lifestyles. And I think a lot of people get mixed up they get love and acceptance mixed up. Yeah. God loves you regardless, Absolutely. but he does not accept your sinful lifestyle. And that's the difference. He's, he's going to love you. If you want to send yourself to hell, he's going to love you all the way there. Mm -hmm. As I so often heard, you preach that bishop. He's going <laughs> to love you all the way there. <laughs> well, you know, I, I used just, to have this, uh, you know, as, as uh, being in the street, we have a way of uh, putting people off when we don't want to hear what they have to say. Mm. And I had this thing, it was kind of, it seemed kind of funny to me, but I realized now it was, I was really treading on dangerous ground. And I remember uh, saying to somebody one time when they just kept talking to me about, it, I kept telling us, look, uh, I'm not going to hell because I've already been there. Mm. And I said, uh, I know I'm not going to heaven because I know that God doesn't want me. And mm. the devil doesn't want me because I'm almost a match for him. I mean, that's kind of <laughs> silly stuff we say. You know, we don't we don't think about it. I mean, because I mean, I was I was one of those people that I would you know I was I wasn't afraid to take a dare, and I wasn't I wasn't afraid of very much. I really wasn't afraid of very much. My father used to my father was afraid for me before he passed, and he always told me he said the one thing that that I'm concerned about is that uh, you're, you're not, you're not going to live to be 30 years old, he said, because uh, you don't have sense enough to be afraid of anything. Mm. And he said, a smart man knows when to be afraid. And mm. uh, he was afraid that either somebody was going to kill me or I was going to kill myself the way I was living. I, was, I mean, I was, it, it was pretty bad. It was, I, did, I did some pretty bad things. And, uh, but to... Mm that day in the church to know that the Lord loved me no matter when I was at my worst. And I mean, he knew things about me that nobody else in the church knew. Nobody knew. And I'm wondering, where's this voice coming from? I mean, mm. he was saying things into my, mm. saying things into my, into my, to my mind that nobody in the church knew me that well. There were things that my wife didn't know, but he just kept telling me, I saw what you did. I was there and I loved you anyway. Mm. And that broke my heart to know that somebody could love me when I didn't have sense enough to love myself. Yeah. That was, yeah. a, that was really powerful. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Wow. You can't, you can't beat God given even his, his grace, his love is <sighs> unconditional. And you know, you were, you were talking Bishop and it's almost like if you have two children and you have one who does everything that you want them to do and they never mm -hmm. rebel and they never say no when they're always yes ma'am and yes sir and you know they're they're perfect but then you have the child who <laughs> doesn't do anything you want them to do you don't love that one any less they're still your child and we're all god's children we all are products of god's creation he doesn't love us any less because we aren't following or aren't mm -hmm. listening or have not accepted him. Or even if we choose not to believe in him, he, mm -hmm. that is, I mean, he just, he's like, okay, but I still love you. 
Mm-hmm. That does not yes. change his love for us, no matter what we choose. His choice is still love for us. Exactly. exactly. Mm-hmm. And for the first time, I guess I, I was, that was the first time, well, the second time that I realized that somebody could love me for who I was and not for what I had to offer. Because oh my. My, my wife, mm. well, my wife, Woo. my wife fell in love with me and I had nothing to offer her but myself. And it wasn't a very good self. And, you know, and uh, right after we got married, uh, less than a month after we got married, she had gotten saved. Okay. Less than a month, she got saved. Wow. And, uh, and uh, 16 days after she got saved, I got saved. Okay. But she, I noticed that there was a, a change in her. Mm. She stopped fussing with me about this, that, and the other. She wasn't fussing anymore. She got quiet. And she just kept praying for me. And she, and she kept... Uh, if she would be reading the scriptures, she would tell me. She sat down, she put in front of me one day, and she tried to get me to read and understand. She was reading something from Romans, and uh, she asked me if I could read it. And I told her, this, I don't understand. It just doesn't make sense to me. It's like it's, it's like it's Greek. It just does not make sense. And she was telling me, she said, you know what? She said, but God wants you to know him. And once I guarantee you, if you give your heart to him, she said, mm-hmm. you'll be able to understand this. You'll understand it, but that's what it's going to take. You can't understand mm-hmm. him your way. And I said, wow. But she just, yeah. but she just kept on in, 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 in small ways, just letting me know that he loved me. And between her and my mother-in-law, they loved me to the Lord. They really yeah. did. You know, I got to put this plug in there. You said something that was so profound. Yeah. You said that God loved you for who you were. Yeah. And not for what you had to offer. Right. Mm-hmm. And I want to tell all my single ladies out there <laughs> mm-hmm. that if you are going to be in a relationship with a man, be in love with someone who's going to love you for who you are and not what you have to offer. Amen. Because that's the way. You should not expect anybody to love you any less than the way Jesus loved you. Mm-hmm. Amen. So I just had to put that in there because that was that just stuck with me that Jesus loves us for who we are. Mm-hmm. And we shouldn't expect any less from anybody else. They love us for who we are. Right. Amen. Amen. Man, key. this is good so far. This is this is amazing already. I love it. <laughs> I'm telling you, yes. And we and we've heard Bishop part of Bishop's testimony, you know. But it just like it never loses its power yeah. when you hear it. You see what I'm saying? It never loses its power. That's why we need to continue to tell of God's goodness yeah. and what he did for us and how we got saved and how he delivered us because it never lo- we're overcome by the power of our testimony. That's the word. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think too, one that's of the things the that I think that's um, that lends a lot of importance to that too and why I seem to remember so well because it was such a dramatic, a dramatic and uh, uh, experience. And it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just um, like some, a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people who have, who can have a spiritual experience and they equate that with salvation, but there is a difference. Mm-hmm. You can have, you can have a spiritual mm-hmm. experience and have it not lead to salvation. Mm-hmm. But I was ready to, at that day, I was ready to surrender everything. And I did. I told him, I said, you know, I, when I said, if you don't, if you can't change my life, if you can't, uh, make my life better than it is, I might as well check out. I was ready to do, to do whatever it took. I mean, whatever. And that day I was totally and completely delivered and set free. What, what rehab couldn't do, salvation did. Mm-hmm. What uh, chewing gum and t- uh, mints and all that other stuff to take the place of cigarettes couldn't do, uh, mm-hmm. salvation did. And I even, got a, I even got a bonus that day. I was healed of a bleeding ulcer. Mm. And I mean, the Lord did, he did, it was a dramatic change. And you don't, a day like that, you don't forget a day like that when your mm. whole life changed. Mm-mm. My you literally God. went from smoking three packs a day in one, from one day and the very next day done. Absolutely. Wow. And never, and never had the desire. He took, not only took it, but he took the Ooh. desire for it. The taste mm. was gone. The mm. taste was completely gone. Mm-hmm. And from that day to this one, I've never smoked another cigarette, never abused any more drugs, and wow. never had another drink. Wow. Now, that was a complete change. That is very But dramatic. it was all him. 
It was mm-hmm. all him. He knew he it was to me, it wasn't just a matter about having a religious experience. I he I needed to be delivered. Yeah. And I was totally delivered that day from all of those things. And uh, once he got that out the way, he could start doing working on the other things that needed work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So, so Bishop, if you can, can you share a little bit about um, your upbringing, your childhood that brought you to the the man that you are today? Like, what? How did how did your childhood play? What role did your childhood play? I guess I could wow. say. Uh, to bring you to, to watch you to the man that you are today. That's kind of, um, that, I don't know. I'm trying to think, I, I, there were probably a lot from my memory, a, a lot more negatives in my childhood than positives mm. that would have brought me to this place. But I was, I remembered, um, there was a there was a lot of unhappiness and a lot a real lack of peace in our home and um, a lot of arguing um, and we weren't very close the children we were I mean we weren't that particular we weren't particularly close and um, but we we struggled to try to make sense out of our relationship. My mother, my mother was a hard worker. She was a tough worker. She worked two jobs, and uh, uh, and she and she did. I think she did an excellent job with all six of us. She she worked very hard to try to keep us together. So we learned how early how to depend on each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things I learned was because the the I didn't get the kind of nurturing that uh, a lot of people think that they should get, a lot of children think they should get from their parent. My mother was not a, a demonstrative woman with her emotions. I mean, she could laugh and joke with us, but she never, she wasn't the kind of person who would tell you a lot of times that she loved us or a hug on us or show us a, that kind of affection. But she was, there was never, we never did without anything if it was in her power to get it for us. And she would fight for us. I mean, if, whether it was, uh, uh, taking up for us, and one of the parents in the neighborhood was offended because there was something going on between us and another child in the neighborhood. She would fight for us, or if there was something going on at the school, she'd always be there for us. Uh, mm-hmm. She she was that she was good that way, but um, uh, she like I said, we didn't get a lot of a lot of the hugging. At least I didn't. I was the oldest, so a lot of responsibility was put on me at, uh, early, so I didn't mm-hmm. get a lot of that. Uh, my youngest sister and my brother, they got more of it than anybody else because there was a, a big difference between us. There was a, a, um, five years, I think six years between me and my brother and eight years between me and my sister. Yeah, yeah eight I, years I, between I, me and my, my yeah, youngest I, sister. So uh, because of that, I, I, they got a lot of the, uh, a lot of the affection and I found myself giving them a lot too because she she would ask me to help her with them, like uh, helping to feed them sometimes if she was busy doing something else in the house. So I learned early about responsibility. And while I didn't I didn't love the responsibility, I knew better better than to rebel against it. And mm-hmm. in spite of in spite of my not liking to do it, I'd actually learned some things. Mm-hmm. And a lot of what I was lacking, uh, my mother's youngest sister, who was living with us when I was born, um, she became almost like a big sister to me. And um, uh, up until the mo- even up until the moment that she that she passed, she went to be with the Lord. She was always there for me. She was always there to encourage me. And I got the hugs from her that I wasn't getting from my mother. Wow. And I got the encouragement through some of the tough times. And even when I was being, uh, I remember one time when I was being bullied and she would always tell me, she said, it's not good to fight, but if you have to fight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you, I'm going to show you what you need to do to protect yourself. I mean, that, that's the way she looked out for me, you know? And uh, so that was, there was a lot of that, those things were a lot of positives in my life, but she was always there to, to uh, 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 the one thing, another thing too, where she was, she and my mother did one thing they did have in common 
was because they always, because I was always, I always had my head in a book. I loved to read. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, the lady that my wife worked, that my mother worked for was a judge. And when her daughter was in college, she brought all the college books home to me and I was learning how to read them. And I, I was amazed that I could understand those concepts, some seemingly abstract concepts of calculus and, and uh, mathematics and some of the sciences and everything. And I understood those things. And they wow. kept telling me, say, you know, you keep, uh, you, keep, you keep on one day, you can be anything you want to be. Nobody can stop you but you. And those kind of things kind mm. of encouraged me to mm. want to be my best at whatever I did. And um, I never let anybody else convince me that I couldn't do something if I put my mind to it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so those were some very positive things in my life. I got that influence from my aunt. I got some from my mother and from, Ju- and from the late Judge Duffy. Um, uh, those are very positive influences in my life. And some too from some other uh, people in the neighborhood when they found out that uh, I was an honor roll student um, they kind of looked out for me too at the same time. And they, even though they knew that I didn't want to be a fighter, I wanted to be a reader and a, I, I wanted to be an intellectual, I guess you could say, you know, I was uh, known as a bookworm. So they, <laughs> <laughs> they kind of looked out for me, you know, until I got, until I got to the place where I figured I had to start taking, picking up, uh, picking up the slack and taking up, taking over for myself and start protecting myself. But uh, they kind of looked out for me that way. So. Those are those are some of the most positive uh, in, uh, impacts on my life that I can remember. You know, looking back. Awesome, and I would just say say two things from that. One, God brought someone to you who gave you what you needed outside of where you thought you would get it from. So right. you know where you know. So we don't have to worry. Of, God will supply all of all of our needs. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we we put that into <clears throat> just a financial box or a healing box, but we have emotional things that we that we deal with or, or things that we need, and who knows us better than God? So God brought that to you. You didn't have to go out somewhere looking for it. God brought that piece mm-hmm. to you, that nurturing mm-hmm. piece to you, mm-hmm. and um, there was the other piece. Good Lord, y'all. <laughs> Say two things. You said two things. I did say two things. What was the other one? Oh, this is bad. Well, I think the other I don't one. know. I don't remember what the other one was. It'll come to me. It'll come to me when you start talking about something else. I promise it will. That's how oh, it yeah. does. I'm getting there. <laughs> didn't think I would, but I am. Man, it was Isn't she too young said? to have those senior moments, Bishop? Mm. No, they can have it at any time. From what I, from looking back, hey, since I, I uh, yeah, I was having them when I was in my, I was having them in my late thirties, early forties. There you go, multi lane highway, trying to figure exactly. out what to get off on. <laughs> there was something else you said. Um, oh, there it is. Thank you, Jesus. That's the kind of God we serve. Encouragement. <laughs> How powerful encouragement is, because you didn't. You said you didn't want to be a fighter. And people around you realize that you want it to be the this, this smart. You want it to have knowledge. You want it to better yourself. And having that encouragement in your life gave you that confidence to say, I could do anything. Mm-hmm. So incur- being an encourager, telling your children, hey, you know, you put your mind to it. You can do anything. Not, you know, you like your daddy. You like your mama. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you're going to be a nothing. Don't, don't put those things out there. But put the the positive, the you know, if you get your head in in, the, in your studies, or you know, or or whatever their strength is, you know, oh man, you 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 draw and paint the the prettiest pictures, or you know, whatever their strength is, encourage your your children or those around you. It might not even be your kid; it could be somebody mm-hmm. else's child that God is using you, like God used Bishop's aunt in his life. So encouragement right. is is powerful and it's huge. So we're all, you know, those ministers of reconciliation. We don't know how God is going to use us to speak into someone's life, but there's, there's, God always has a way for us to right. sneak, sneak his name in the conversation or, or just get him in there. So mm-hmm. that's, that's, that was the second thing. 
<laughs> and also, I think too, you can take what seems to be a negative in a child's life and turn it into a positive. Yes. You know, I remember when my youngest daughter, and a lot of people know Janaya, <laughs> and know that Janaya has a very strong personality. She's strong will, and she's a you know, and what was being taken as her being too grown and too bossy, her head start teacher took it and turned it into a leadership opportunity. Say mm -hmm. okay. She can be a leader, okay? Let, let her go to the board and lead the class in the ABCs for the day, or let her lead the line, let her lead the lunch line. So we can take what you know, what we what may seem to be negative in our children and turn it into a positive and 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 allow them to use those gifts that are, that's coming out in a negative way. They can use it in a in a in a, in a positive way. You know, she's got leadership qualities, mm -hmm. you know, that. I, I found too that sometimes sometimes you have to fight. Uh, one of the things I had to learn too was that I had to learn how to fight without fighting. Mm -hmm. That makes any sense. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, when I was uh, the summer that I turned sixteen, I had an emotional breakdown. Wow! And um, oh wow, sixteen! Yeah, I, Ooh, I never heard that one. It was. Uh, I knew that. It was just one of those things that just. I guess it had been coming for a while. I had been uh, emotionally kind of uh, pushed down for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I wonder why when I did, haven't done anything, I haven't done anything to deserve it. Mm -hmm. And yet I was always taught to, because a lot of it was coming from an adult that you, you don't argue with adults, even if they're wrong. Mm. And, and for a while there, I, it seemed like I had nobody to fight for me, you know, and uh, so I had, uh, I tried within myself to try to uh, cover a lot of the, the hurt and a lot of the, uh, uh, the anxiety that I was feeling with books, um, uh, drawing pictures, because I was a pretty, pretty good artist, and other things to try to cover it up. And just, I uh, just kind of withdrew. I, I withdrew to the point where I actually almost was uh, wasn't really talking to anybody. Mm. And mm. Uh, so for a long time there, uh, it it just it it just kept uh, mounting and mounting and mounting until uh, one day during the summer. It was during this during that summer uh, that I turned sixteen that um, I kind of just lost it. And um, I put all all my my siblings out of the house, and I locked myself in. Wow. I just locked myself in the house, wow. and uh, I don't remember anything after that. But I remember uh, that somebody had they'd gone to one of the neighbors. A neighbor found out where my mother worked. They called my mother. She came home. I left her job and came home. And when they got in the house, they broke in. And they found me sitting on my bed, uh, uh, just sitting on the bed, rocking and crying with a knife in my hand. Wow! Oh, wow! Uh, so they took me. She took me to a doctor. Uh, the doctor was a lady doctor. She took me to this lady doctor, mm -hmm. who then uh, recommended me to go and talk to this uh, psychologist who's on staff uh, at uh, Salisbury University. Well, Salisbury State College then. And uh, Dr. Benjamin May, so they had him, and he, you know how they do it. They take in there when you're young. They give you all these tests, the Rorschach test, and uh, they gave me all of these uh, um, uh, tests where you uh, match figures with 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 what you're thinking and all this stuff. It, you know, they give you all of that stuff. I guess probably the kind of thing that that uh, Dr. Jung and uh, Freud probably used when they were trying to figure out what's going on with people, and. Um, <laughs> They did find out that I had a above average high IQ and that my sensitivity would not allow me to express what I was really feeling because I, 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 held, I held everything in mm -hmm. until I was almost ready to explode. And that's what happened. The fact that, that I cried instead of doing some harm to somebody else or to myself, they said, was a positive. And... Um, so I just kind of held on to that, and I kept going. I kept going back and forth to him for a while, and even even after that, I mean, I was getting a lot of teasing about that from my siblings. They didn't understand, and I guess maybe I didn't understand it fully either. And I just kind of here, it forced me to kind of withdraw within myself again, 
but it was different after that. Mm -hmm. um, any closeness that we had, it just wasn't there anymore because I'm wondering why, why can't they understand? Why doesn't anybody understand what's going on with you? My aunt did, but she couldn't help me mm -hmm. because there was a, a rift in the family and uh, that was one of those things that caused a problem because everybody said, well, you're, you're, siding, you're siding with him with, with him and you're trying to tell me that I don't know how to be a good parent and all it was a, it was just not a very not a very pleasant thing and um, until the plate the time when I made up I made up my mind what exactly what I was going to do so I did what I had to do and I towed the line until I got out of high school and I made up my mind before I graduated from high school that I I, I had always wanted to go to college and uh, I wanted to be the first in my family to go to college and get a degree. Well, I was so upset. I wanted to get away from home so badly that uh, mm -hmm. I was ready to do whatever it took. And the only way I, out that I had was to go and join the Navy. Wow. So I, without my mother's knowledge, I got my father to sign for me to go in the Navy. And mm -hmm. uh, she didn't find out until graduation night that I, I was actually going. Wow. And the night I graduated just happened to be on my mother's birthday. Ooh. And I told her, uh, she told me, she said, I got some news for you. She said, Judge Duff has been working for you and she's gotten you a four year full ride, full scholarship oh. to oh, Shaw goodness. University wow. down in Raleigh, North Carolina. Wow. Everything was paid for four years. And I told her, I said, I can't go. She said, why? I said, because I'm going, I'm leaving June the 10th which was exactly one week later, I'm going in the Navy. And she mm. wanted to know why. And I wouldn't tell, I just, I just told her until a couple of days later, I finally told her when some, there was a, a lot of stuff, negative stuff going on in the house and I blurted it out, but it came out in anger mm. that, that uh, I, I need to get away from here. I don't want to stay here anymore. And the only way I can get away and stay away is going to Navy and I'm not coming back. And that's the way, I, that was how I felt. And um, things started to change a little bit after that, but I just really, I thought that my only way of maintaining any kind of uh, sanity or any kind of reasonable uh, emotional and mental level for myself was to get away from home and away from all the stress and all the pressure. That was my way of dealing with it. And uh, I was told that I was running away, that I didn't care about the family and all that. I just need to get away. Mm. Wow. Wow. So did that, um, so not being close made it, did that make it easier just to leave? Yes, it did. Because you weren't that close. You didn't have the stress of worrying about what somebody would think. You didn't, at that point, it didn't matter. You needed to go. Right, I just need to get away. And I didn't feel, I really didn't feel like I was gonna be missed that much. That, I mean, that's how, at the time, that's how I was feeling. I really didn't feel like I was going to be missed that much. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't find out until later, um, I guess be, maybe three, four months went by and uh, I got called into uh, the commander's office and, and I thought I was really in some trouble. I was like, what have I done? And he called me in there and told me, told me what was going on. He, he gave me a lecture and told me, he said, listen, he said, I am giving you a direct order. I want you to write a letter to your mother and wow. send it home. And I want to make sure that you write at least one letter a week. Oh. Oh. Because I hadn't written home and I hadn't called. Wow. Mm -hmm. I figure I'm on my own. I'm on my own. And I hadn't called, I hadn't talked to anybody from home for over four months. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they, they made me write home. The Red Cross, my mother called her, she had called the Red Cross and the Red Cross called them and they told me, I, it made me write home. That's what they, well, they did that with a lot of people, a lot of people who, who, who that's what they do when they don't hear from me for a while, they make sure you write home. Mm. Wow, that's 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 a lot. 
Yeah. Uh, but you know, but it it totally did shape you today. Um, just so many things that that you experienced, or you, the good stuff and the not so good stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can personally say I can toot your horn as you know, saying you're 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 very nurturing as a father. Um, you know, you you give us the hard line, <laughs> yeah. but you're still very very nurturing, and you know, a, as a as a father. So I will say yes. you know, the stuff that you you've experienced has has really been a good thing for those who you shepherd. Well, that I, I give the, I give all the glory to God for that, because the Lord really I mean, I remember when I got saved. Um, I remember talking to my late pastor, Elder Clifton, and I asked him, I said, Elder, I went to him one day and I said, uh, Pastor, I need to know something. I said, can you give me some scriptures that are going to help me? to really be the kind of father that I need to be. And he asked me, he said, well, what do you think you are now? I said, what kind of father do you think you are now? I said, well, I'm pretty good. I said, I think, but I'm, I'm more like a good friend mm. to them than a father. And so we sat in his office and we talked. And he told me, he said, well, he said, there are no scriptures that I can give you that are going to make you a good father. He said, because just giving you the scriptures are not going to do it. Mm -hmm. He said, but if you want to be a good father, ask the Lord to show you what to do. Wow. Wow. And um, because because when I met my wife, I met the kids, I I loved them right away. I mean, I was just, I was just, (laughs) it was just an instant attraction. I mean, you know, they just, they took to me immediately and I liked them I mean they were they were just great kids you know what I mean and I loved them like they were my own but I kept feeling like there's more I got there's I want to make sure that I do the things and give what I didn't get oh wow you know I want to make sure that I I I do the kind of things that I'm, I'm I'm gonna be the kind of father that I believe God wants me to be you know what I mean? Because I want to give them a good start on life. I don't want their lives to be, to be uh, them to have to try to uh, feel like they're swimming in mud to try to make headway in their lives. I want to give them a good sense of direction and give them a, a, a path to walk in that's been proven, you know. And so, um, but at, a little by little, um, the Lord started showing me and I became their father and their friend but the lord told me to be their father first and i learned to nurture to teach and that's uh psalm 22 6 came became really paramount in my life proverbs 22 and 6 train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old uh they won't depart from them and it's another way they should go not the way you want them to go but the way they should go Mm. yeah yeah and so uh and I started, we started doing things. My wife and I started doing things together. And she was a big help because she really helped to make it easy. You know what I mean? And she wanted to let them know that, hey, we're on the same page and we want the best for you and that he loves you. And uh, she was telling them things that um, I would never have dared to say. And she was telling them, she said, look, she said, I'm not trying to turn you against your father. She said, but your father's not here. She said, he is. She said, he's your father. She said, a father is more than just somebody who uh, helped to bring you into the world. A father right. is somebody who's here for you, mm-hmm. who, who takes time with you, who cares about you, and who does for you, who's trying to uh, make you, uh, to grow you up to be a responsible adult and to be a, a good person. I said, that's what, that's what a father is. And, and from then on, they, they started to call me their father. And the most amazing thing is, one day they got their heads together I knew then that the Lord had me on the right track when they called me one day after work and said, we want to ask you something. And I said, what? We want you to sit down. I said, okay. And Karen spoke up. She, she, was, a spokes, she was a spokesperson for the group. And she said, oh, we, want to, we want you to adopt us. We want your last name. Oh, wow. And I almost cried. Oh, wow. I almost cried. Mm. And... Um, I drew them to me and put my arm around them. And I, I sat them down and I talked to them. And I told them, I said, you know, I said, nothing would make me happier. I said, but 
it, the fact that you feel that I am your father is enough for me. I said, but you, you have other family and you come from a family of good people, of uh, God-fearing people who are, they have accepted me and they love you and I would be robbing you mm. of your heritage and uh, everything else if I asked you uh, to take my name. I said, y'all understand what I'm saying? I said, I appreciate it. I said, you know something? I will never, I promise you that I will, you, I will never make you sorry that you see me as your father. I promise you, you'll never, I'll never make you sorry. And I, and to this day, as far as I know, I never have. Mm. And, mm. Um, um, but mm. just to know that they wanted me to adopt them and they wanted to take my last name, that really meant so much to me. I can't even, even today, I, I get tears coming to my eyes and I can't tell you how much that meant to me. And that let, let, let me know that, that everything I had asked God to do, he was doing. He was mm. teaching me how to be the kind of father that I really wanted to be. And he was helping me to become the father that I didn't have, you know? And I was kind of uh, living, reliving my childhood through them mm. because I was trying to look, what would I have wanted? What kind of, uh, what kind of father would I have wanted? What kind of uh, loving would I, did, would I have wanted? What, and that's what we did. When my w wife went to work on Saturdays, our, we, we, we started forming, we started uh, making traditions, our own traditions. I would take them out to McDonald's on Saturday morning for breakfast. Aww. And then we'd either go to, the, we'd either go to the, the park and we'd eat our breakfast at the city park or we'd go ride and then we'd go up to the, uh, go up to, uh, the Laurel Flea Market and uh, we would look around there and I'd get them a little something. And uh, they liked they like those... Uh, this lady up there made these fried donuts. The mini donuts. The fried donuts. Yeah. That's yeah. great. If you don't and get I'm, donuts, it's a wasted trip. <laughs> <laughs> and one Saturday, we went, one Saturday, I took them all the way to Baltimore. All the way to Baltimore Jeez. while she was working. And we mm -hmm. went to the Lexington Market. And we mm -hmm. walked around the Lexington Market. And I remembered to bring her some, uh, some uh, fresh roasted peanuts. <laughs> and I bought us some fresh roasted peanuts. We had lunch up there and we came back and I, when I came back in time to pick her up from work. And they, and, and they bought it before I could tell her, man, they started, I mean, they just unloaded all of them. At the same time. What a good time they had where we went. And, but those kind of things, we, we just enjoyed each other. We enjoyed doing things. Um, when something came up at the school, if she couldn't come, they would call me first because they know I'd go mm. to the school. I would go to the school. I'd be there for them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, assemblies or whatever things going on, I could take off work. I'd go there and I'd be there for them. Uh, PTA meetings, things like that. You know, I was the one. I mean, I was their father. That that was that was the height of my life <laughs> during their growing up years. Oh, you know what I, mean? I love it. That I had made it. I had made it. You know, I I become a real father. That that was. Mm -hmm. You know, that the, was awesome. I just love it. I just think that you're such a great example to what a lot of fathers, a lot of men mm -hmm. could really um, learn from and could mm -hmm. take heed to what you're saying because you didn't let what you went through as a child become an excuse to be, to not be um, the father that those children needed at that time. Mm -hmm. You used what was negative in your life. And like, again, like I said, you turned it into a positive and you made that to be the reason why you stepped up to be the father to them because you realized that you wanted them to have better than what you had. And I just wish that a lot of men would take that stand. A lot of people actually would take that stand on life, not to use what they went through as a childhood as an excuse to be who they are. You know, you have abusers that say that they watch their father abuse their mother. Well, that's, they, and that's why they do it. Or they watch their father or mother drink and that's why they do it. So instead of taking, you know, using that as an excuse, then you use it as a reason to turn around, to turn around and to do better. You know, you know how you felt. Like I told one guy, you know, you know how you felt as a child when your father didn't show up. Don't do that to your child. 
you know how that feels and you don't want them to feel the way that you felt. Mm -hmm. So Bishop, you know, we applaud you. I know, and I know you give all the glory to God, but it's just yeah. such, such refreshing, so refreshing to hear um, how you became a father to, to those children. That's just awesome. Now I know, I, and look, Karen responded, no, she said, never, not sorry. She said she loved you, Dad. So she said she's not sorry at all. <laughs> <laughs> Never was sorry. So I mean, I just just beautiful. You can't really. Be. <laughs> That's what she said. You know, I I one of the other things too I think too is that um, I remember uh, my sister asking me, oh, since I've become a pastor, she asked all. Oh, I stopped since I've become an elder, and she asked me one day how I could forget so easily mm, wow mm. Mm. what was uh and why i took the stand that i took and she accused me of deserting them when i left home she said we need you i said but you didn't need me i said i'm your brother I was not your father. Mm, yeah. And I said, I could never take the place of a father because I didn't know how. I was only 17 years old. Mm -hmm. Right. And I said, I couldn't feel that. I couldn't feel that, Lord. I said, but you know something? I come to the place where I realized that I needed a father. And God gave me himself. Mm-hmm. I said, and I have a father. I said, now, a lot of people can live without one. And I said, I've had men in my life who have been somewhat of a father figure for me. They've been there for, and much older, and they've been very strong influences in my life. And uh, uh, like I said, Elder Clifton, uh, the late Bishop Fletcher, Elder Porter Deal, these men have become, uh, they were, they were great influences in my life and they were also great fathers, every one of them. Mm -hmm. They were all great fathers. And, uh, but that was also one of the things that helped influence my life as a pastor. That the fact that I realized that I had to give what I had received. God gave himself to me. He became totally the father that I needed. And he helped to heal a lot of the things that I had been missing in the first 32 years of my life. Mm. He gave me, he made up for all that I had been missing. I mean, he filled a, he filled, that's a big void. That is a huge void. And wow. he filled, he, he began to fill that void from the very first day that I, that I got saved, that I gave my life to Christ. And that he had been filling it, filling it, and filling it, and filling it. And he kept filling it and putting it in me to be able to give that same, that same uh, love to other people. And that's mm. one of the reasons why I guess maybe it seems mm. sometimes I, I, I get, I, I wonder sometimes as a pastor if I'm, if I'm, if I'm uh, treading into territory that I shouldn't be in. But I always, I, I, you notice I preface it a lot of times. I said, the Lord has given me the uh, uh, the pastoral feeling, and the pastoral feeling is more than just than just a sheep keeper. The pastoral feeling is is uh, the feel it's a fatherly feeling, and I feel like because I, especially since I'm the oldest person in our church, that I have an obligation to present my image of God to the people. And that is that God is our father and that God has, has put me in a place to father a lot of people because we've had a lot of father, mm -hmm. a, a, a lot of people in our church who have grown up without fathers. Mm -hmm. And I try to let them know to love them the way the Lord loves them. You know what I mean? And to be there for them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I can't, I can't take Jesus to the place. He is our go between. He is our advocate. And I always try to point people toward him but I still feel like I have an obligation as a pastor that I work for our heavenly father. 
-hmm. I am his representative uh, in the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And so I have an obligation to love the people as if they, you're not my sheep, you're his sheep, but I have to love you as if you're my children. Yes. And that way mm -hmm. I'm going to be very protective of you. You know what I mean? I'm going mm -hmm. to, to, to have your welfare and your well-being even above my own. And whatever it takes to, to be sure that you receive the best that, that your Heavenly Father wants you to have, I'm going to bring that to you. You know what I mean? Even if it costs me something. You know, mm -hmm. whatever it takes, I'm going to bring you that because that's, that's what I feel. I'm, I'm, I'm obvious. It's a mandate. Mm -hmm. I don't feel where I have a choice not to do that. And I think that every pastor, my opinion only, I think that every pastor should have that kind of fatherly feeling toward the people that he pastors, to love them the way a father would love his own. Because if you love them that way, you're always going to want mm -hmm. what's best for them, you know, and you'll put their needs ahead of your own. Yes. I mean, I mean, am I making sense? Absolutely. Yes. That's and I'm so thing. grateful that you yes. that the Lord showed you to do it that way because man, we have benefited. Absolutely. And so many others have benefited from your tutelage and your and your fathership. I guess that's a word. I don't know. It's a new one. It's a new one. <laughs> I created a word. <laughs> Y'all heard it here first. <laughs> but yeah. man. I, I know I can speak for myself and I'm pretty sure many others that we're grateful. So yeah. grateful. We're so grateful. grateful. So Bishop, any last words of wisdom you want to leave us before we uh, do our uh, Close uh, Jesus check before we, uh, <laughs> we gotta, we gotta check about, we gotta put Jesus out there now. We gotta check for Jesus. Well, I just want to say that I think, uh, uh, the two greatest things that have happened um, that have happened in my life are, first of all, giving my life to Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and uh, marrying my wife. Because really, everything, everything, a lot. The fact that I came to the Lord, you know, I say, I said before that uh, she, my my mother-in-law was primarily instrumental, but then also my wife was instrumental in doing it too because I started seeing. I started seeing when she got saved, I mean, there was an immediate change. It was enough of a change to see that a different, there's a different, there's something different. And um, those things impacted my life. They really impacted my life. And I'm, I, it's, it's something when you can say that uh, a person uh, to lead, there's a difference between leading somebody to the Lord and trying to drag somebody to the Lord. <laughs> I, know I, I give a lot of instruction that way to a lot of uh, wives or fiancés to let them know, listen, you cannot drag somebody to the altar. It's not gonna work. You have to lead them and they, wow. and, and, and you lead them by the life that you, by the life that you live. And uh, I can truthfully say that yes, she led, she led me. She led me because she got, even during the time uh, before uh, she got saved, she always kept talking to me about, she, you know, you know something, I want to get back in church. I want to get back in church. And that's all she talked to me. She, she kept saying it all the time that she wanted to go back to church. She wanted to go back to church. And uh, uh, from where she explained to me how the difference is, the difference between when she got saved and before, there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? And, and the difference was obvious. It was obvious from the very first day and uh, I could see it. And for somebody who didn't know anything about salvation, I saw it and that made a huge impact on my life. It really did. And it's still making an impact 40 years later. Mm. Wow. <laughs> so your testimony was, so co-pastor's co testimony wasn't just in words, it was with her life. Exactly. And her her actions spoke louder than her words. Yes, her and, been, and she's been good. And it's cons the consistency has helped me. You know. Yes. See, my granddaughter is coming. Hey, to put in the parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and and he that findeth the wife findeth the, the good thing. thing. <laughs> he found her, and the Lord knew time and place and opportunity and 
you know, let God work it out because he knows what he's doing. He has a divine plan at work. Yep. Yes. Amen. Bishop, yeah. thank you so much for sharing you so you. Much of your story with us. Thank You're you for having me. Oh my gosh. And that's just, and that's just little pieces. I mean, there's, I know there's so much more you could have gone into, but we're grateful for what you shared with us. It was very powerful for the, for the person and, and the redemption and the deliverance. Yeah. And, and then as, as a man and a father, and then as, as a pastor and a preacher and a husband, so many, um, and a father and so many things that you gave us, so many nuggets that you gave us. Yeah. I'm so grateful yeah. that you shared that with us on, on tonight. Man. Thank you. All right. So here we go. Now, this is a good time if you don't know Jesus to get to know Jesus. Because the good thing yeah. about getting to know Jesus, there ain't no right time. <laughs> There's no perfect place. Um, you just need to know that he loves you. And I think we have talked about that, that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus loves you. He already yeah. gave his life, died on the cross for your sins. So you don't have to worry about being too bad because he's, all, he's already done the work. So you could be the worst person in the world. It doesn't matter. He already gave his life. Amen. for whatever you could do in the future so it's already a done work all you have to do is surrender yeah you know you get to a point in your life when you're just tired you know the rat race gets overwhelming it gets to be too much and when you get to that place where you just when you're my mom um one time told a co-worker of hers and she shared with me that if you get to a point in your life where you feel like you can't do anything else with your life, give it to the Lord. Mm -hmm. When you get to the end of yourself and you think you want to check out, that's the time to end yourself and give yourself to Jesus and let Jesus take your life and make your life so much better. Mm -hmm. I mean, so much better. You see life different. You reason mm -hmm. different. You react different. People come to look at you and they're looking for the old you and they see a new you and they're like, mm -hmm. whoa. Ooh, uh, yes. You take them completely by surprise and it's not you, but it's what Jesus has done in you. And yes. he is no respecter of persons. It's not how much money you have or don't. <laughs> it's not what family you're from. Mm -hmm. or, you know, it, mm -hmm. None of this stuff matters. We are God's creation. He loves us all. And if we have a, a have a, an earthly father who knows how to give us good things, our heavenly father knows how to give us so much better things because he even answers prayers that we don't even say out of our mouths. Yes. I don't know if yes. any of you have ever experienced yeah. that, but you just think of something and you don't necessarily go and, and pray, oh God, please do this. Oh God, sometimes you just think it and whoo, God provides Ooh. it. I'm telling you, he is that, Ooh. that's the yeah. kind of God we serve. Yes. Amen. I offer you the opportunity to serve this same kind of God. So if you don't know Jesus, you can bow your head right now and say, Lord, yes, I give my life to you. I'm a yes. sinner. I do bad stuff. But I thank you. To, mm -hmm. It's so nice to know that in spite of all the bad stuff that I've done, you love me. Yes. You love me through all the sin. You love me through all the lies. You love me through my yes. habits. You love me through my disappointments. You love me yes. through all of my regrets. You love me through all of my, my bad thoughts. You love me through all of my bad words. You love me through all of my bad actions. You love me. And thank I you, thank you that I understand that that will never change. You've loved me from the very inception of me. From my very beginning, you loved me. And I thank you that you allow me to know this information this night. That is, no matter what I've done, I am loved by the most high God. Now, Lord, I'm not perfect, but I know you're perfect. And I ask that you would just come into my heart and change yes. my life. Yes. Do what only you can do for so long I've tried to do it my way and my yes. way just don't work. So, Lord, I give you my life so that you can have your way with my life. Father, yes. I thank you that Jesus gave his life for me. He died on the cross. He took my punishment 
that should have been me on the cross dying mm. and shedding blood but he took my place and now because i have accepted jesus into my heart i am a candidate for heaven and eternal yes, life yes. Thank so you. not only do i have life and life more abundantly on this earth every day is a new day with new mercies but i have the hope of glory i have heaven to look forward to and to live forever and ever and ever and no time and no end walking on streets of gold and being in the presence of God and of Jesus. Father, thank you for this opportunity to give yes. my life to thank you. you. Thank you yes, for this Lord. fresh start. Thank you for this clean sheet. Thank yes, you for Lord. this new thank life. You. Thank you for opening my eyes. And Father, I just thank you, oh God, for being so good and for just keeping me up to this point so that I could give my life to you. God, I bless you. I praise you. Father, I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, y'all, this has been episode three of, and that's the kind that's of the kind God, God we serve. We serve. <laughs> so I hope y'all have enjoyed. I hope you all tune in. When's the next day, Jonda? Thank you all for joining us. The next day is May the 4th, I believe it is. May the, the first, first Monday. Wait a minute, I can tell you. Give me a second. Hold on. Is that um what they call that Star Wars Day? May the fourth be with you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, it is May the fourth. Yes. <laughs> May the fourth before Cinco de Mayo. So yes, 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Yes, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So please, yes. please, please join us. We I've enjoyed doing these. So I hope yes, you I have enjoyed to. this as well. And it's just good to let the world know. You can see the power of a testimony changes so many lives. So don't be yes. bold. Be brave. Share your testimony. People yes. are waiting on you to tell yes. them on what God has done for you. Yes, this has been a blessing. This has really been a blessing. I'm so glad that we're able to do this and we're able to share with so many people. And thank you all that have joined on tonight. Um, those who have been with us every episode so far and those yeah. that are new, we thank God for you. And we pray that you're being blessed and we pray that you have uh, received something on tonight that it can help you just going a little bit further that encouraged you and just help you to understand and know that God is still good. He's still amazing. He's still blessing his people. And he has everything under control. Don't worry. Be happy. Mm. <laughs> Bobby McGrath made that song years ago. Don't worry, be happy. Be happy. But not just happy, be joyful. Joyful. Be joyful mm. because joy is everlasting. Mm -hmm. Happiness is conditional. Yes. yes. Be joyful. We love you guys. We appreciate you. Thank you, Lydia, for being working with. I'm so glad we get to work together like this. This is awesome. I, I love, love it. it. I know. I, love it. I can't wait till we can do this side by side again. But thank God yes. for the technology that the Lord has allowed. <laughs> thank, God for technology. thank you for Zoom, Jesus. Yes. <laughs> and Facebook, yes. Jesus. And we will let you know. <laughs> yes. Thank God for Facebook. Thank God for technology, period. And we will let you guys know who our next guest is going to be. We're working on getting the schedule for May. We'll let you know as soon as possible. We'll get the flyer up so that you can um, know who's coming on next. And like I said, if you want to join us, if you want to, um, you know, come on and be our guest, let us know. We'll be glad to have you. Everybody has a testimony. I know somebody's got a good one to tell. Right. And we want to give you the opportunity to do so. That's right. <laughs> All right, you guys, we love you. God Thank bless you. you. Love y'all. Good night. Good night. <laughs>
Yo, post in this doggone chat how to end this thing. I don't remember. Lydia, click on the live up top. It won't let you end it from there? No. It just made the screen bigger. Yo, post in this doggone chat how to end this thing. I don't remember. My name is Pam. Lydia, click on the live up top. I did. I want that you end it from there. You mean the little red live that's on? Yes. 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 What about down at where you started the live at? I don't remember. What about where you started the live at the bottom? Oh, like in the Zoom? Yeah, the three dots at the bottom where it says more. You know, when you go to live stream. Little red live, that's all. Yes. Yes. Oh. What about 